Sadly, this is the last final week of our message series for the season of Easter that we have been calling Rise. It's all about the steps that we need to take in order to call down God's powerful grace from heaven so that we can rise above whatever is keeping us down in life. You know, whatever the headache or the problem, the crisis or the damage is in your life, You can't relieve it, you can't solve it, you can't avert it, you can't repair it on your own. You need the grace of God. And the good thing is, he's always there, prepared and ready to pour out his favor in your life when you take the right steps and meet him halfway. And this week, we're looking at that last fifth step that will help us access God's grace like a catalyst calling down his grace. Years ago, when I was thinking about becoming a priest, I helped out at a confirmation retreat down in Southern California. My priest friend in Los Angeles, Father Vaughn, had invited me to attend this retreat because I was thinking about being a priest and he thought it would be a good opportunity for me to shadow him and to kind of learn what a priest does on, this, on these kind of things. And the retreat center was a really big place, really large. It was in the desert in Southern California. So there's a lot of space, a lot of land. And there were several other groups that were present there, not just our group. Although his church, and I'm very jealous, his church has 10,000 families. Can you imagine that? So there were like 300 kids just on this one confirmation <laughs> retreat. It was enormous. And I remember standing in the lunch line one afternoon, and in front of me there was a group of people talking. Now, I don't ordinarily eavesdrop, okay? I just want to make that clear. But this was sort of unmistakable. It was hard not to hear it. And this group of people in front of me, waiting in in the cafeteria line, they watched as a group of our students crossed in front of them. They were carrying their trays of food. They'd just gotten their food. They were going to their tables. And they were unmistakable. Our kids on the confirmation retreat were unmistakable because they were wearing T-shirts that said, you know, St. Mary's Catholic Church and had a crucifix on the outside of their T-shirt. And as they walked by, one of the ladies in the group in front of me turned to the others and whispered, Oh, those are the Catholics. They think they can earn their way into heaven. (laughs) And as if on cue, the others chuckled and shook their heads and clucked their tongues. See, I was surprised to hear that. Did you know you had to earn your way into heaven? Did you know that? (laughs) I was surprised to hear that because I had become a Catholic 20 years earlier and, and I thought to myself, gosh, if that's true, I got a lot of catching up to do. (laughs) But I was also confused. I was also confused because think about this. The Roman Catholic Church is the oldest institution in the Western world. And it's been the primary driving force behind the development and the progress of civilization itself. For example, modern medicine and all the other professions were born in the cradle of the university system that was created by the church in the Middle Ages. The rule of law that now governs all enlightened nations today evolved from the church's system of canon law. The largest non-governmental charitable provider in the world is now and has always been the Catholic Church. And from awe-inspiring architecture 
to the pages of great literature, to sublime pieces of sacred music, to breathtaking works of art, the church has provided innumerable goods for the benefit of humanity. And despite the evil it has done on occasion through its 2,000 years of history, overall, it has been an undeniable force for good in the world. It has done so many good things for so many people. Now, of course, there are many different types of people, including many non-religious people who do a lot of good in the world as well. They volunteer their time, they donate their money to good causes, they try to improve things. And like most humans, they're moved with compassion for the plight of the human condition, or they're spurred on by remorse for past failings and they wanna make up for those, or even they might be motivated by the desire to feel good by doing good. There's nothing wrong with those motivations, those reasons. Guilt is a great motivator. Empathy defines our humanity. And the internal reward system that we have that encourages us to help others, well, it's God-given, it's natural. But what is it, I thought to myself, what is it that has uniquely inspired the enormously positive Christian influence on the state of our world over the last 20 centuries? Was all that work really undertaken simply by people trying to earn their way into heaven? Didn't sound right to me. So I wanted to know, what is it that really motivates all these great accomplishments by Catholics and in truth by all Christians? In other words, I was searching for the why. Why do we do so many good things that have lasted? And I found the answer in the passage from the Gospel of John today. This, this Gospel that we're looking at today. And the scene is the Last Supper. The 12 apostles are gathered around their teacher, Jesus, who will die the next day on the cross, and everyone knows it. And there is one final lesson that has to be taught. And here's what Jesus teaches. He says, it was not you who chose me, but I who chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will remain. And the fruit that he's referring to is love. And he says it in the very next line, this I command you, love one another. He even says it twice in the same passage so that there'll be no mistake. This is my commandment, love one another as I love you. And then in the very next line, Jesus discloses the incentive, the reason, the why of love. If you keep my commandments, he says, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. You see, the motivation to do good works, the motivation to do good works for Christians, the reason we do it is to remain in the love of Jesus. And when we remain in the love of Christ, we're able to accomplish great things. And what we do will have staying power because of this great exchange of love between Christ and us. Let me break it down just a little bit more for you. As we said a few weeks ago, God's grace comes before everything else. It inspires us to conversion. God's grace moves our heart to turn back to the Lord and receive his forgiveness. And when we're converted, then we're justified in God's eyes. We're made right in his eyes. And that's because As John says today in the second reading, God sent his only son into the world as expiation for our sins. So our sins are forgiven because of the cross. But as we said last week, salvation is not just about forgiveness. There's more to salvation than that. It's also about becoming more like Christ. And it's God's sanctifying grace that helps us to grow gradually in his image. So it's like this, think of it like this. God helps us take a step towards him. That's the grace we get. And then once we choose to take that step, grace further enables us to take more and more steps. It's very much like how parents help their toddlers learn to walk. I mean, today we're celebrating um, 
Mother's Day and all that mothers have done to foster the growth of their children. Moms, do you remember the first time your babies tried to stand? Do you remember that moment? You cheered and you clapped. You, you helped them to walk. You rushed over to them. You stuck out your index fingers just like that lady was doing and you helped them walk. You walked right behind them, you protected them when they fell, and you helped them try again, over and over again until they finally succeeded. That's the sanctifying grace of God. It helps us with each step we take along the way. And believe me, there will be times when you feel like you can't take one more step. It's too exhausting. You've fallen too many times. The problems are too great. The demands of a day, too many. And you just want to give up. But if you place your disappointments and your fears in the hands of the Father, those same hands will lift you up and help you to walk again. And then, and then, as we become stronger in our walk our spiritual journey, and we start to grow into the maturity of Christ, then we eventually manage to begin imitating him. We respond with works of love. We do a good deed. We perform a good act. We start noticing the people around us who are hurting and take the time to help. Life begins to seem a little less about us and more about the needs of others. There's a niggling feeling that we, that we ought to give back, that we were put on earth to contribute, not merely consume resources and take up space. And you may think that you have little to offer, that there's not much you can do. I mean, the world's problems are so massive. Every day I talk to people who are just so discouraged with the state of their world. And it discourages me too. (laughs) And so it can just seem like everything, all the problems around us are just too big and we're just one person, you know. Maybe you think you're too old or too young or too exhausted or too imperfect or too flawed to make a difference. But God designed you to make a difference with your life. Do you remember the story in the Bible when Jesus fed 5,000 people. He did that with just two fish and five loaves of bread that were given to him by a young boy who probably had nothing else to give. See, God will take our paltry works of love and crown them with his glory. God's grace bestows a supernatural quality on the good works we do. He ennobles our efforts. He perfects our charity. What little we can do, he multiplies, magnifies, and makes it good. We don't earn our way into heaven, but we are given what we deserve because God's grace raises up our works of love and makes them meritorious, makes them honorable. You see, what sets Christian service apart What gives it its staying power over 2,000 years, what has made it a major force for good in the world, is the why, the desire to remain in the love of Jesus Christ. Because every good work is strongest when it's motivated by love born of a relationship. Every good work is strongest when it is motivated by love born of a relationship. And it's because of this relationship with Jesus, this exchange of love, that what we try to do makes a difference and is worthy of eternal life. One of my favorite movies, although it's really, really hard to watch, is The Passion of the Christ. You might remember it. In 2004, Mel Gibson wrote and produced this movie that shocked the world. And it shocked the world because of its extremely graphic description of the crucifixion of Christ. It begins in the dark of night in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it ends when Jesus breathes his last on the cross. There's like no relief through the whole movie. 
But for me, one of the most touching scenes in the movie happens when Jesus falls on the way. He's carrying the cross. He's bloodied, he's beaten, he's exhausted. The crowds are jeering at him. The Roman soldiers are lashing him with whips, forcing him to continue. And just at that moment when he falls, the movie suddenly flashes back to his childhood where Jesus is a toddler, a small child, growing up in the small village of Nazareth. And he's in the backyard. It's a sunny day. He's playing under the watchful eye of Mary, his mother. And it's quiet. And it's peaceful. It's serene. And the little Jesus takes a pretty nasty fall. You know, he trips on something. And Mary, like any good mom, rushes over to him, you know, picks him up and comforts him, holds him in her arms as he's crying because of the fall. And then just as suddenly, the movie violently returns to present-day Jerusalem. And his mother, watching in horror as the full measure of Roman brutality is unleashed on her son, she is powerless to help her baby boy now. And she is absolutely stricken. Her love can do nothing to save him at that moment. But our love can. Our love can. Throughout the centuries, Christians have loved their neighbors, prayed for their enemies, because they never want to see Jesus fall again. They never want to see Jesus fall again. Not in a child who goes to bed hungry. Not in the poor and the homeless struggling to survive. Not in the lonely or the grieving. Not in the immigrant turned away. Not in the abandoned senior. Not in the abused or unborn child. Not on our watch. Not in our time. Christ said, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And Jesus did just that because of his love for the Father. And so we also are called to lay down our lives, to sacrifice some of our time and our resources because of our love for Jesus Christ. And as imperfect as they are, our own works of love are made worthy by the grace of God. And so if you're ready to take that next step, if you're ready to start loving like Christ or, or start loving more like Christ, I just want you to know we have over 18 different ministries and missions here at St. Hilary for you to consider. You can go on our website at sthilary.org, go to the Next Steps page under the Serve tab, and you'll see everything that you can do for this church and for the poor among us. We'd love to connect with you and get started. If you're here on our plaza, you can talk to our, our, our administrative assistant, Diana, who's at our welcome desk at the entrance of the church. Please pray about getting involved in a ministry of service if you aren't already so that your works of love will be crowned with the glory of God. Over the course of this series, we've invited you to consider five simple but critical steps to access God's grace and help you rise above whatever keeps you down in life. We call these steps connect, pray, heal, grow, and today, love. When you connect with other people in a church community, when you build a friendship with God through prayer, when you allow him to heal your wounds, when you choose to grow in your faith, you will begin to rise above whatever clouds hang over your life. But it is that final step of love that will propel you even further into the heavens. So in the words of John, who stood at the foot of that awful cross, beloved, let us love one another. 
because love is of God.